Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant, O oh merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. first reading is from Joshua. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, for therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors believed or served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, and whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and for my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did these great things in our sight. He protected us along the way, and we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. The word of the Lord. Please join me with the psalm that's going to be on the screen. The eyes of the Lord are righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. To root out the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears them, and he delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he will save those whose spirits are crushed. Many are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver him from all their own. He will keep safe all his own. Not one of them shall be broken. He will shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. The Lord ransoms the life of his servants, and those who will be punished must in him. The second reading is from Ephesians. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this, of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole, whole armor of God, 
so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to, able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching is difficult, who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit that gives flesh, the flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ.
One of the things that makes my time away very relaxing is being assured that you are in good hands. Uh, that is very important to me. And I'm very grateful to Mother Susie for her liturgical and pastoral care and leadership while I was gone, and to Marnie Ike and Joe Molino for their oversight of the office and administration as it needed to happen. I knew if I needed to know anything, I would know it, and if I didn't, I would find out when I got back. <laughs> uh, but I, it's easy to, to, to do that and to trust them. And I also express gratitude to you for this time away. Thank you. Uh, it's important to us, uh, and I'm very grateful to you for it. Many years ago, I was functioning as a bivocational minister. And what that meant in terms of the way I, I was living it out is that I spent some uh, unpaid time working with a local, local congregation as an unpaid assistant. Uh, I did some uh, supply work around the diocese, but my full-time pay-oriented stuff was that I had a, uh, a private pastoral counseling practice. One day, as I was coming out of a meeting, my receptionist said, your bishop called. Now my bishop was, at that time, I've, I've generally had good relationships with my bishops. Well, except for one. <laughs> now this bishop didn't really care for bivocational ministry. I always felt that there was somebody was out to get him with some of this or whatever. I don't, I don't fully understand it. So every conversation where he had called me for the past, I think it was about three years at this point that he had been there, two or three years, every, every time he had called me was to yell at me, <laughs> was to, to uh, confront me about something that I had done that he didn't like, that I may have done in a very similar way under a previous bishop, and it was okay. So I get this message. And you know what my first thought is. What have I done? I have no idea. I've really done nothing out of the ordinary the past few days or the past few weeks. Why would he be calling me now? So I called him back. And after a few pleasantries, very few pleasantries, <laughs> he said, Ray, the reason I'm calling you is you probably know that in the neighboring county we have a small mission station. It, didn't even, it wasn't large enough to even be a mission church. It was just a small mission station. He, I said, yes, I, I'm familiar. He said, well, and I've been staffing that with a retired priest. Uh, and, the, and he said he can't drive. They have to go 40 miles to pick him up and bring him up to do service and then take him back. Uh, and he said, that's all fine and good. They're fine with that. But he said, he has to have surgery on his eyes. And would you be willing for them to consider you to fill in for the time period while he's recovering? I said, well, let me talk with the folks with whom I need to talk. I'll call you back tomorrow. And I did. I called back and I said, sure, I'm, I'm open to being considered for this. And he said, well, the senior warden will call you in the, in the next little bit of time. And a couple of weeks went by, and finally they called, and we got together, and, and sure enough, we, we came to an agreement that I would be uh, the priest that would go over and do services for them, and should there be a pastoral emergency or something, I would, I would fill in. And I was, I was happy to do that. My thinking was, this will be a great gig, because he, he went on to say, there's six of them in average for attendance on Sunday morning. <laughs> and get this, they meet in a dentist office. <laughs> the dentist was a member of the congregation, and so he just offered them the space to meet there, and I thought, this is a great gig. There's no expectations. All I gotta do is show up. So I did. And I went over, and it was a little different. We didn't gather around the treatment chair where you get drilled. <laughs> and I had mixed feelings about that. I had already kind of built myself up for it. 
but he had a, a larger space in the back of his office, and they had designed this to be a mini chapel. And they had chairs like what we have in here, and they probably had nine chairs or 12 chairs in that room, and it was set up in a very traditional chapel style, and they had put in a little altar rail that was movable, and they had an altar up there, and it, it all looked very, very nice and very traditional, and it was just kind of nice to go there. And sure enough, there were about four to six people would show up on Sunday morning. Went on for a few months, and it was probably two or three months, and, and one Sunday after the service, the senior warden came up to me and said, I, I need to talk with you about something, and I thought, oh, what have I done? <laughs> There's a pattern there, isn't there? <laughs> it hasn't stopped. And he, we went off to the side, and he said, here's the deal. He said, we would really like for you to stay on and to be the priest for here. And I, he said, would you be willing to consider that? I said, I can't make any commitment to you. You need to go talk to the bishop. I said, I, I'll be open to talking to the bishop and, and whatever he decides about that. But I said, I, that, that's, that's, that's up to the bishop. Well, I get this phone call a few days later from the bishop. It wasn't quite as dire, I didn't, because I, didn't, I, I, I knew he might be calling me. And he said, Ray, he said, they've, they've come to meet me with me. They want you to stay on. And he said, this other priest is healing well, and he's getting about ready to start back, and I've got something closer to him that I will have him do. Are you open to doing this? And I said, sure. Well, something changed when I said that. You know that thing about this, is a, this will be a good gig? No real expectations. At the, more, at the moment I said yes to him, I felt expectations. And they weren't from him, which was unusual. They were from me. And over the next few days, and then as I met with, with the senior warden and with some folks there, I began to build these expectations, and I began to, to fantasize, and I thought, you know, if we do this, I bet we can, we can add, I bet people will come for that. And if we do that, man, I think we can grow, and I think some things can happen. And lo and behold, we began to do a few of those things. The, the deanery had some extra money, and they, they paid for a consultant to come down from the seminary to consult with us on, on small church development and all of these kinds of things. And the bishop... His big emphasis was on planting churches. So he had a parishioner in one of the other churches in the diocese who owned many franchises of a fast food restaurant. And so he was willing to give us the demographic data on specific areas, including ours, so that we could look at that data and project what type of church we could grow there, how large it could be. And we did all of that, and it was so exciting. And we moved out of the dentist office, and we moved into a wedding chapel. <laughs> it was bigger. And eventually, we bought our own space. When we moved into the wedding chapel, it, this was in the 90s, and you were just beginning to be able to purchase certain things online and during that time. And I discovered that we could buy a mailing list. We wanted to contact people in that immediate area. And I discovered that I could buy a, 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 a mailing list with as many people as I wanted to pay for on it within certain areas that I would decide. And that that mailing list would, would, would be exported into an Excel file and I could sort it by column and I could set up different sorts of, of email, of, of not email, but mailing list and, and we could do that. And so I did. And so we would send out I want to say it was maybe 400 mailings. We, we just developed these little postcards, and we'd send them out three or four times a year. And every time we would send them out, a new family would come. And most of the time, they would stay. And we would grow. And it was wonderful. And one day, as I was looking at this Excel sheet to see if I wanted to change anything and come up with a new mailing list, 
I looked at one of the columns by which I could sort it. We had sorted according to family size. We had sorted according to religious interest. You know those things when you fill out these forms and you go somewhere or whatever? That's those mailing lists. I bought it. <laughs> and I looked at that one column, and it said income. And I thought, you know, if we're going to be successful, we really need to have people who are better able to give more money. And I can sort this mailing list in that way. And then I thought, don't do that. And then I thought, no, no, if, if, I, if we want to be successful here, we've got to do something like that. And then I said, no, no. No, don't, don't do that. I didn't do it. We buy in to a specific definition of success. In our lives, our daily lives, we do that. I find that for me, I, I, I define success out there and in daily life uh, and in organizations and institutions and, yea, verily, even churches by three questions. How many, how much, and how soon? How many people are involved in this? How much money are we generating? And how soon can we make it happen? And by all accounts, as best I can tell, Jesus didn't use that criteria to determine success. Not at all. I mean, a few weeks ago, you, you heard the Gospel from John about Jesus feeding the 5,000. How he... 5,000 people came to see Him. And he fed, and he, he talked with them, and then he fed them. And it was wonderful. And then today, we start out this gospel with some very grotesque descriptions. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. By the way, I never read that scripture, but what I hear it with Bella Lugosi's uh, accent. Today's scripture, even though he's done it before in these readings, he's talked about bread and wine. Today he talks about flesh and blood. And what happens? People go away in droves to the point that he looks at his disciples and goes, Et tu, Brute? Are you going to stick around or are you going to leave? Jesus didn't use the same criteria for success that we do in our world and we often do in the church. Jesus, could you imagine if he had been a candidate for rector of a congregation? And he sat down with the search committee or with the vestry and they said, well, Jesus, Tell us what's happened in the past couple of weeks so we can kind of get a picture of how you would be here with us. And he says, well, you know, two weeks ago, I was out here on this hill right over there. Did you see it? 5,000 people. And yesterday, one of the most magnificent things happened in our lives. 4,900 of them left. I don't think he would have gotten the job. You and I, you and I claim a really faulty understanding of what it means to be successful. And it causes us all kinds of problems. It keeps us from holding accountable leaders who act in horrible manner, who treat other people 
like animals and refer to them as such. It allows us to refuse to hold accountable leaders of businesses and corporations and institutions who abuse and misuse their employees. It allows us to move abusive clergy from one congregation to another so we don't have to hold them accountable for what has happened. It allows us to not be active in being faithful people. And it becomes our excuse because we're afraid if we do, the economy will suffer, our finances will suffer, or people will leave. You and I cannot buy into this idea of success. I do it. I'm not going to say you do. I do. And it is ruining our faith. And that's not to say that, that there is not some criteria for, for success. What I'm saying is that it's not based on how many, how much, and how soon. But one of the most beautiful, beautiful stories to me in the Old Testament, was our reading today from Joshua. Oh, how magnificent. Joshua has taken over after Moses' death, and it's his job to lead the people into Canaan. But they're going to have to, they're going to, have to fight to make it happen. But Joshua knows something has got to happen. And so he stands up before the people of Israel, and he looks out there at them, and he says, it's time to make a decision, folks. It's, it's time to do this. And here's, here's the decision you've got to make. You know, over, this, over my lifetime, this is what's happened. And he said, our decision today is, decide on, is to decide on whose God is going to, which God is going to be our God. There are plenty of gods. And you can choose the gods, the God of, of your, your parents when they were in bondage in Egypt, or you can choose the God of the Amorites, or you can choose any God you want. But I have to tell you something. In our lives, Yahweh has made a difference. And Yahweh has been there. And Yahweh has been present in transforming us. And today, I'm telling you, I'm choosing Yahweh. So the folks go, hmm. Well, you know, Yahweh's done that for us. And Yahweh's done this for us. And today, we're going to choose Yahweh too. You and I have chosen God. And we've chosen God in the way in which we've chosen to follow Christ. So our criteria of success is how Christ-like we will be, how much we will show our love of God and the depth of our love of others, and how much we will let it grow. And not just let it grow, but help encourage it and tease it along. Now don't get me wrong. I love to see new people. There's always more room for more ministers to touch people's lives. That's what we do. That's why we're here. That's what the church is about, to be Jesus. I'm always good with that, and, and I do get some sense of pride. If the budget balances and the numbers grow, but the problem when I change my priorities 
and I take on this fractured sense of success and I don't let God's love in me show forth through others. So, here's where I am. I pray for your prayers. I ask for your prayers and I pray for your prayers that I might have the strength and the clarity to see the ways in which I base my life and my faith upon things that just don't work. And that I have the courage to let the love of God show forth in me to you and to everyone that I encounter. And I hope you will join me in that. Amen. Let us stand and profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made of one being of the Father, through whom all things were made. Yes, and for salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in one Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds with the Father, who with the Father in the Son is worshiped and glorified. Let us join in prayer with God's people in all times and places. We pray for those in authority throughout the world. We pray especially for Donald, our president, Rick, our governor, Randall, our mayor, and all legislative and judicial bodies. We pray for the leaders of all faiths, especially our presiding Bishop Michael, our Bishop Dabney, and all clergy at Iona Hope and our partners in faith. Lead us and all people in the world to desire peace and goodwill for everyone and to work for peace and justice. Instill in us a love of your creation and a desire to treat it in a caring way. Hear our prayers for all who are hurting in mind, body, and spirit, especially those listed in our bulletin, our pets, and all offered in voice and thoughts. Receive into your eternal fold all who have died. 
Comfort our heart as we mourn. Comfort us, Holy Spirit. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for the ministries of Iona Hope, especially the lectures. We offer our thanksgivings for the many blessings of this day, for our guests and those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. We pray for those who are committed to our daily prayers, especially Presiding Bishop Michael Curry, Mary Ann, Marilyn, Daniela, Rhonda, Rob, Nellie, Richard, Kivana, Francis, Carrie, Shannon, Tom, Cody, Chase, Timothy, Andrew, Maureen, Kirsten, Mindy, David, Andrew, Evie, Napoleon, Phyllis, Lisette, Larry, Phil, Evie, John, Gail, Debbie, Kathy, Lewis, Jean, and Bruce. We pray for the repose of the soul of Beverly Dolbeck, who recently departed this life. In our congregation, we pray for the Young family, the Youngquist family, the Zentis family, the Zinza family, the Zook family, and the Abbott family. We also pray for our pets, especially Katie Lee, Maddie, Sugar, Howard, Boo, Gabe, Boogie, and Champ. Are there others for whom we should pray and blessings for which we give thanks? Let us confess our sins to God. We confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you.
the multitudes by the lakeside by blessing the gifts of a few people. Bless these gifts to the feeding of the hungry, and bless us in your service, for we ask it in your name. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses. In this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and have their being. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have, Have mercy, mercy, Lord, for, for we, we are, are sinners, sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood he reconciled us. By his wounds we are healed. Therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, <coughs> apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. So, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our Father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. That the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen, Risen Lord, Lord, be known, be known to, to us in the, in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praise his Father, through Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done, done on earth as in heaven. heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This is the true bread which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. So come to this table, you who have much faith, and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often, and you who have not been here for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed. Come, it is Christ who invites us to meet him here. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to me.
Now in joyful thanksgiving for all the gifts we have received, let us pray together saying, Eternal, Eternal God, God, Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, you have graciously accepted us as, as living members of your Son, Son our Savior, Savior, Jesus Christ, and, and you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant, and grant us strength, strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As you have been fed at this table, go to feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go to set free the imprisoned. As you have received, give. And as you have heard, proclaim. And the blessing which you have received from Creator, Son, and Spirit go with you. Amen. Amen.
Alleluia, alleluia, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia.